Welcome to Masterclass, a collaboration between the virtual world diplomacy community and Brother Board's Diplomacy Dojo. The host for this week's Masterclass is the one and only Brother Board. Brother Board is a podcaster and blogger and accepts coaching clients in the game of diplomacy. If you are a reader of his blog or a listener of his podcast, you know he has a lot of insight about all things diplomacy. He said something in one of his podcasts that interests me, something about from playing diplomacy, he can sometimes tell when people are lying in real life. Thank you for your time, Blake. I have prepared an outline given what I've seen on the other master classes. Usually there's some lecture component before we get to Q&A. That's not my usual style when I'm doing podcasting. I'm usually trying to be more conversational with the participants and just see where just see where things go. That's what I prefer to do. Where I'm going with that is if you want to interrupt and say something or you want to follow up on some point, just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and say something. Uh, I really mean that uh, interrupt and say something. Or if you have a question at any time, you just want to go down a rabbit hole, that's okay with me. But I have prepared a presentation. So uh, what brings me here today is the topic of detecting lies. And that is a very interesting topic in diplomacy. Everybody knows that lying is a component and Everybody expects to be lied to a certain extent, but uh, the exact methods that you could use to improve your ability to detect lies, that's not, uh, that's not something we talk about all that much in the diplomacy media community, the content community, the people who are making advices about diplomacy. We're usually talking a lot about the countries and openings and strategies and that sort of thing, and of course that's very important. But I think that to do well in diplomacy, Having a certain ability to detect lies is a pretty big advantage, even though that's not a skill that's particular to diplomacy. As Natty said in the introduction, detecting when people are lying to you is just a general skill. It's a general life skill, not just a skill for any game uh, or diplomacy in particular, but everyday life. You're bombarded with manipulations and lies and information and all sorts of everything in between, and uh, learning to perceive the differences is advantageous to any person. So, let's start talking about lies. I, uh, I moonlight as a philosopher, sometimes I say, uh, especially on my blog, and the first thing that comes to my mind when we're talking about lies is, what is a lie? What, what, what is that? What are we talking about when we say a lie? And of course, to understand what is a lie we really need to know what is the truth. So in our conversation, we talk about lies. We're throwing around this word lie all the time without necessarily having a particular definition in mind. And diplomacy players are no different. So let's say, for the sake of this discussion, that telling a lie is when you say something that isn't true and you knew it wasn't true at the time you said it. It's a pretty straightforward definition, but... When we actually try to apply it, we may find that a lot of what people call lies are actually other kinds of manipulation. They're not really lies. For example, a misleading truth, that's not a lie. If I'm Turkey and I say, I'm opening to Black Sea because I don't trust Russia, that could be true at the same time that I'm trying to negotiate a juggernaut alliance. I could be opening to Black Sea because I don't trust Russia and also trying to negotiate the Juggernaut Alliance. But maybe my statement, by saying my statement in, a, in, this, in this way, this misleading truth, I'm hoping that somebody else is going to read into this, oh, Turkey's not, not working with Russia, even though I never said that. Or a statement that is uttered by somebody who's just indifferent to whether what they said is true or false is not a lie. In my experience as an American, we usually call that BS. When someone's just saying things without regard to whether it's true or false, it's just whatever's coming to their mind. But that happens in diplomacy. And then, of course, there is the possibility that actual truth can be very manipulative. And uh, you haven't been lied to when you were manipulated by others pointing out a truth. So if I say, 
hey, your ally has a really good opportunity here to backstab you, and uh, while well, I think they're likely to do so, I think you should try to defend yourself. That could be a 100% true statement that influences the alliance to lose its cohesion, which is probably the reason why I said that truth. So in order to understand what is a lie, the lies are defined by reference to the truth. Let's talk about what are some truths that there might be in diplomacy that a player could forge into a lie. First, I'm going to categorize one group as observable facts. Observable facts can be truths. In everyday life, that can actually be a little tough uh, to know what is a fact. Let's be honest, some facts are pretty convoluted. But in diplomacy, this is rather obvious. We're talking about what's on the board and maybe the rules of the game. So that's plain to see for everyone. Everyone can see what's on the board, and nearly all players won't lie about the board itself because it's way too easy to see through. But that's not the whole story. From time to time, you will find a player who's willing to risk a lie about the rules. Like they might mislead you or lie about how a complicated set of moves will resolve. I've encountered that. I've also noticed that some players will lie about what happened in the past. What the past game states look like is a little harder to parse, especially if you're playing tabletop. If you're playing face-to-face, -face, you probably have no record of what the past game states look like that could be used to confront the person saying such a lie. The other category of truths that there could be in diplomacy that a player could change into a lie is what I'll call intentions. And there are at least two kinds of intentions in diplomacy, one which I'll call immediate intentions, and I'll define as, here's the orders I'm entering this turn, or maybe sometimes, these are the orders I'm going to enter for this turn and the next turn, for complicated tactical plans. And the other one, I'm going to call this strategic intentions, and I'll define that as what players are trying to accomplish by their moves and their intended moves that are more than one or two turns out. And I think it helps to break these down because why a player would lie about these things and the way you would go about detecting these lies is a little different. So when it comes to a player's immediate intentions, this is probably, for everybody here who's showing up for this masterclass, this is probably what you had in, in mind when you're thinking about lying in diplomacy. In diplomacy, each player enters their move at the same time after some negotiation. And to an extent, the players are relying on what they learned from their rivals to decide what to enter, right? Like sometimes players directly state things, uh, let's leave Galicia open. I, I won't move to Galicia. And then they do exactly what they said they weren't going to do. So the lie is very plain after the fact. This definitely is the most important kind of lie to get good at detecting in diplomacy because failing to detect this lie has an immediate consequence and can often be devastating. And it's actually the easiest to do something about if you detect it. And we'll get to that. But I also want to put in here this idea that players can lie about what I'm calling their strategic intentions. And so this is when players are lying about the underlying reasons for their moves or lying about their ultimate objectives. These lies are a lot harder to detect, and there's also not as much you can do about it, even if you detect these as lies. So I'll give an example. Let's say Italy tells you, hey, I'm moving my lone army in Tyrolia. I'm moving that army over to Bohemia. Okay, and you're, you're thinking about that, and you deem this to be true. Yes, I believe Italy. I believe Italy. He's going to move that army in Tyrolia to Bohemia. It's not as important that the army is moving from Tyrolia to Bohemia. What you're really concerned about is the deeper question of why? <laughs> why is Italy doing this? Why is Italy moving this one army from Tyrolia to Bohemia? Whatever Italy tells you, it's going to be really challenging to figure out if that's true or false. Unlike when players make a move and then you find out quick whether they were telling the truth or not, it could be a really long time before Italy's ultimate intentions are revealed, or even because a player's intentions and goals can shift every turn, even if Italy tells you one thing, 
and then a few turns later does another, Italy could justifiably say, well, it was it was true when I told it to you, and I later changed my mind. And uh, if it was true when Italy told it to you, then you're not going to be able to detect it as a lie, even if uh, you wish that Italy had you know, kept that promise or whatever the case may be. It's hard to detect a lie when a player uh, is blind. So before I start discussing techniques for detecting lies, does anybody want to talk about the things that diplomacy players would lie about and what are the truths in diplomacy? What do you think is a good strategic lie or why is somebody lying about their long-term strategy if it's always shifting anyway? Okay, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Strategy is a broad topic, but let's say, uh, let's say for instance, your strategy is to get a solo win. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, you want to win this, this round. Maybe it's, maybe it's a tournament and, uh, you really badly need a solo win in order to advance to the next round. And anything less than that is not helpful to you. And so you're just going for a solo win for sure. But if you think that the players around you perceive that about you, they may not want to work with you. They can, hey, you know, this guy over here can advance to the next round with just with a good draw. And maybe he's trying to play it safe and get a good draw so they can advance to the next round. Okay, you may need to convince this player that you're just playing for a good draw. Whatever it takes to lie about that. If you can successfully lie and persuade the player that you're playing for a good draw, you may get them to cooperate with you in a way that they never would have if they understood that for you, this is a solo win or bust kind of game. In fact, I'll say it's pretty typical for players that are playing for a solo win to, by a degree, act like they would settle for a good draw, whatever that may be, however that may be defined. Does that make sense, Nanny? what I'm trying to say here, that you can have incentives to lie about your ultimate objectives? Yeah, that didn't even occur to me that almost every game, somebody might at least keep in mind the possibility of going for a solo. But at the beginning of a game, no one ever says, if the opportunity's there, I will absolutely stab you for a solo. And though we all know the tension in the game, that given the right opportunity, 95, maybe 99% of players will take a solo opportunity. That's right. And that is at the highest level of strategic thinking. And players may even lie about some of the particulars, like maybe, okay, we agree that uh, we have a juggernaut alliance. I'm Turkey and you're Russia, and we've both admitted to each other that we're playing for a solo win. Maybe neither of us can advance in the tournament, or, or somehow neither of us can achieve our goals without a solo win. So both of us are willing to risk the other solo to get our own solo, and we're going to play this juggernaut alliance as far as it'll take us. We both admitted that to each other. But maybe my plan as Turkey is actually not really to play the Juggernaut Alliance. And I have this other idea in mind, which is that I just want you to destroy Austria for me. And I think Italy's the better ally for me because Italy's dumb as rocks. And I think that my chances of getting a solo win is best if Italy is my ally instead of you. So I put all this effort into selling you on a Juggernaut Alliance. And it seems very credible, you know, it seems very credible and realistic. But I simply have already determined that I think my best chance of winning is to destroy Austria, then Russia, then go for Italy, because Italy seems really dumb and will lose in the end game to me. So I could lie about that, even while admitting I'm playing for a solo win. Let's move on a little bit. I'll start going over some techniques that I can call to mind that I think are helpful. The first broad category of techniques that I use to look for lies is something I'm going to call here, consider the content. That's my advice. Consider the content of what they said. So I say, let's think through how you can parse out what a person actually said, the words and the semantic meaning of the words, not so much how they said it uh, so I think that when we're talking about detecting lies in diplomacy, oh, some of us, some of my fellow players, are overly focused on what I, I'm, I'm going to jokingly call here the metadata surrounding what someone has said, as if that's the real trick to detecting a lie. Those are tells, right? <laughs> the tells, the circumstances of how someone said it, how they were acting and behaving. And, and uh, we'll get to that today, for sure. Uh, but what I want to say 
is that I think your starting point should first be the content of what was said. Does it hold water? Is what they said alarming by its terms? So one thing that I look for is whether the, what the person's telling me is too vague or short or otherwise inattentive. And the reason why I think this is a sign of lying is that they're just not putting in the effort because they're planning to attack me. Or they don't want to lie so thoroughly to put so much effort into the communications in case they later regret it, they have to change sides, and they want to ask me to trust them again. That's a pretty common habit among players, that if they're getting ready to attack somebody, they just sort of start ignoring them because they don't want to lie to them too hard in advance of the attack. For me personally, uh, knowing that, <laughs> I, I don't make that my habit because I'm afraid that people will detect that I'm about to attack them in a surprise attack. But as it were, I think that's pretty common in how players behave. So if they're, you know, they're not, they're not interested in a concrete plan or making some specific negotiation, or they said, you know, they, they wrote messages that are short, or they just don't seem like they're paying attention to what we're talking about. That's what I think. If the content of the messages is not concrete, and elaborate, that may be a sign that the, of their indifference, and they're indifferent because they're going to attack. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I would also say my experience has been you do need to be careful because there's a lot going on on the board, and sometimes folks can just be busy, and there's just not a lot to talk about with you at that particular time. Even allies, right? Sometimes it's, it's just obvious what you need to do. I've seen a number of cases where people, you know, do follow that advice, and I found that it was not necessarily warranted. So I think it's totally true that, you know, it's something to watch out for. But I would just say, you know, make, make sure you, you think about the entire context of the board. That's great. I really appreciate that caveat. And I agree. When making the overall assessment of whether a player is lying to us, we should consider all the signs taken together, right? Not any one specific thing is, aha, definitive proof that they lied. But if you got three or five signs that they're lying, <laughs> they might be lying. Absolutely. I, I think that's very good. I, I'm glad you pointed that out. And just, so I'll elaborate on my point and say, I don't consider any one thing to be dispositive, but rather it's a more of a cumulative effect before I realize that somebody's lying. Another thing that I look for in what they're saying is inconsistency. And that's because someone telling the truth can tell a consistent story with relative ease because the tale they are telling is anchored to fact and memory. Whereas a liar is creatively spinning up a fiction and may have difficulty remembering what they are saying especially if they are telling different lies to different players. And if you perceive that a player isn't communicating a consistent idea or narrative about the game, that player may well be just making it up. And they're having trouble keeping their story straight because it's so much more effort than telling the truth. You get, give me an example of that, of somebody changing a story. Like, are you talking about like one negotiation period to the next? Or do you mean like you are talking to other people and England is telling you A, but England is telling France and uh, Germany B and C? So I'll say both and I'll elaborate on each one. The first is, let's say that you're suspicious that there is a France-Germany alliance. It seems evident to you, but France and Germany are denying this. I mean, you're, you're some other power like, like Austria or something. And both France and Germany are saying that uh, they don't like each other and they're just they're going to be at each other's throats any second, but they just need to finish what they're doing. I'll attack them any minute, but, you know, just not quite yet. And what they're saying as to why they are waiting or how they're reacting to things is just not consistent. Like, hey, wait a minute. Two years ago, you told me it was a really big deal that France moved into Belgium without permission. And now it sounds like you let France into Belgium with your permission. So what what was that about, right? They were lying back then, maybe. And neighbors especially that are trying to play out a close alliance 
will often try to throw all kinds of fog and doubt about uh, how loyal they are to each other and, and constantly saying how they're about to backstab. But you can parse out whether that is likely to be true or not based on how consistent the messages are from each player. Because if they're just, they just decided to work together, they decide to be joined at the hip and play the game out, one of them may make mistakes in the lies that they're saying to other players about what were happening in their internal conversations or, or how angry they are at each other, and that kind of thing. So that's to your first observation, your first point about this. And to your second one, yes, if England is telling France one thing and Italy a different thing and Germany a different thing, somebody's being lied to. Somebody has straight up been lied to, and it could be you. <laughs> you could be the one being lied to. Whereas if everybody seems to be hearing a consistent narrative or a consistent claim, then it's more likely to be true since most players are hesitant to lie to everybody about something, especially in the early and mid game. The only thing I worry about is getting the story from other people. If Italy is telling me that France is saying X, did France really say X, or is Italy telling me that France said X? So where is the origination of the lie? Somebody's lying. It could be Italy, <laughs> it could be France, but I'm not sure which of the two it is. That's true. It's uh, You're relying on uh, what we call in my profession hearsay. What so I say that somebody else said this, and so now, not only do you have to wonder whether France told the truth to Italy, but whether Italy's telling the truth to you. Right. When you've got a double hearsay situation, it could be two lies so that nobody said anything remotely close to what Italy is now claiming France said. Because Italy has distorted the original lie, so now it's a double lie. And not only that, but it would be really hard to call Italy out as a liar. Because if France doesn't do as Italy said France would do, Italy can just say, well, France lied to me, even if Italy was the one who lied. Another mm, type of information in the content of what they're saying that uh, can be suspicious is when the player is telling you things that are too good to be true, or they too easily give in to what should probably be a difficult negotiation point. The reason why that should make you suspicious is that a great tactic for a liar is to tell the person exactly what they want to hear. Most people are so pleased by being promised uh, what they wanted or being offered what they wanted that they don't look on it too further. Their natural skepticism or their natural scrutiny is, is lowered a little bit. Again, like I said earlier, none of these things is automatically a lie. It's just something that's suspicious, and if combined with other suspicious things, hey, maybe this is a lie. So when I'm talking about things that are too good to be true, I'll give an example. I've played plenty of matches where I get what we call sometimes a Janissary. There's a player who's nearly eliminated, and they're going to try to help me get to a solo win. They say help me as much as they can just to act as a spoiler, to keep the match going in return for my uh, not finishing them off. And they'll, you know, they'll really try to sell it on how badly they want me to solo win. They'll, I want you to solo win. I, I hate those other guys, and I'll, I'll do it. And I'm not saying, you know, that, that that absolutely does happen in diplomacy. But sometimes they are lying. They are lying about that and trying to sell me on how I'm going to solo win so that I won't, I'll get so excited about it, right? They want me to be so excited about the prospect of solo winning that I overlook uh, what else is happening with them acting as my janissary. And so when the time is right, they don't keep their promises and try to recover a little bit, uh, maybe after I've moved past their position or something. And it turns out they didn't really want me to solo win. They were going to fight tooth and nail for the draw. So when someone says something that might be too good to be true, like they want to throw the game to me, I think about that, and I'm like, okay, I just want to make it sure that it's only possible for them to really throw the game to me, and uh, not possible for them to somehow try to turn it around. I won't, I won't completely trust them just because they said something that I like hearing. The other version of this is a little more subtle, where I say that there's someone who gives in too easily to a negotiation. Ooh, okay, this is a tactic that I, I myself employ, uh, this is very successful, in setting up for a backstab, which is to have a convoluted discussion about 
different piece movements and where each one precisely needs to go. And I'm prepared to agree to anything because I'm not going to keep my promise. The purpose of the conversation is simply to find out what the other player's moves are. Because if I know every single one of their moves, I can then exploit it or help another player exploit their moves. And that, that's entirely the goal. The goal is simply simply to get the information of what the moves are going to be. And since that's my goal, I'll agree to whatever. I'll agree to anything, no matter how favorable it is to this other player, because I'm not going to keep those promises. So when the shoe's on the other foot and I'm trying to negotiate with somebody and they're just giving in on everything, I'm like, really? Is this, should, we, should this be a negotiation point? Is England really going to let me be an English channel? And that's what, when those things start adding up, I become suspicious. Like, eh, maybe this person's just, just telling me whatever, giving me anything in negotiation because they have no intention of keeping these promises. And it makes me suspicious. Another iteration of this that I've noticed is... Uh... When people are dishonest about the likely outcomes of something, they can talk about a move being guaranteed when it's not guaranteed. It can happen strategically on the board, too. I remember once I was playing an alliance with Germany when I was Turkey, and we were moving across the board pretty well. And they were telling me, oh, just move into the Italian centers. I'm going to go some other direction. But when someone's trying to stretch your position out that far, the discussion about the individual move set and what's going to happen this turn might not be a lie, but they may be lying in terms of uh, working to benefit the alliance as a whole. And that kind of leads me into another question. Uh, since I didn't really just ask a question, I kind of just did, shared some experience. What about uh, alliances and sort of, that's not necessarily a statement that's been made each turn, I am your ally, but it's kind of a presupposed uh, truth and it's a very nebulous one. So it'd be interesting to hear you talk about uh, how those come into uh, individual discussions. Let me uh, try to repeat back what I'm doing to make sure I understand your, your question. Are you asking about when um, a player seems to be your ally by implication, maybe you haven't directly stated, hey, we are allies, and you're concerned that this isn't true and they actually have a, a, an ally who they care about much more? Well, I'm more uh, stating, you know, what if you have stated that you're allies in 1902 and now it's 1905, you've been working together, there's sort of a presupposition that you're continuing to work together at the beginning of the negotiation, right? How often does that need to um, come into the conversation and what do you do when you're doubting it? I personally think I have a probably a negative tendency to reaffirm the alliance frequently, which may make myself seem suspicious or paranoid. That's a fascinating question. We're talking today about detecting lies, and so I'm looking at this from the perspective of I've had an ally for several years, and I want to know if their intention is to continue with the alliance or what's going on. I think it is valuable to try to get the other person to say in words some concrete statement of what is their intentions, and that's because that makes it possible for you to detect whether they are lying or not. So one thing that I do to try to figure out if a player is to figure out for sure whether they're lying is to try to condense their thoughts and strategies and feelings and things into something concrete that they could do or not do. And then I ask them to do or not do that and see if they keep their promise. And in that way, I can figure out if my whole overall understanding of their thinking I can at least affirm that I'm not way off the mark because they were able to meet this request that I am asking for. So I'll, I'll make it a little more of a concrete example. Let's say that I am, I'll go once again to be Turkey. Hey, I'm Turkey again, and I'm in, a, I'm in an alliance with Russia. And, you know, like most Turkish players, I'm not feeling too great about this Russian fleet that's in Romania or Sebastopol or something that I know uh, as soon as I fully move out of position to really lean into this juggernaut, that fleet could move into Black Sea in combination with even one other hostile move and I, it might be toast for me. So I am trying to ask something of Russia, like, hey, Russia, I have this idea for how we could uh, disband your fleet and we build it as a fleet in St. Petersburg, North Coast or something. But let's do this. Let's, let's make that happen. And if the Russian player is uh, got full of excuses or they won't do it or if they come from it's a bad idea, I, I, you know, I start wondering as to whether they're lying to me about their ultimate strategic intentions. Because if their ultimate strategic intention is to play the juggernaut as far as it will go, then having that fate in Romania becomes more and more of a liability if the game progresses. 
both in terms of my being able to trust my ally and that the fleet literally does nothing if we're working together. So if what they're saying now is like, no, I really don't want to mess with that fleet. Okay, that's kind of inconsistent with playing the juggernaut as far as it will go. So maybe they're lying to me. And there's not always as obvious a solution as that, but I can I think it is a really good tactic to try to take the agreement and make it into a move. That sounds like a really good idea because the moves are concrete on the board and the discussions are not. That's right. Even some small gesture of good faith or trust can evidence the truth of what they're saying. You're, you're Italy working with Austria, and Austria's like, listen, please move that army in Venice to Piedmont or even Tuscany, but just just get it out of Venice and not to Tyrolia. If you, you know, okay, if my intention is really genuinely to work with Austria as far as that will go, then the only reason to keep that army in Venice might be just to confuse other players <laughs> about whether we're working together or not or how much we trust each other. If I really mean it, I really do want to work with Austria as far as that can go, or it seems like the right thing in the circumstances, I should probably honor that overall strategic idea with the move, and vice versa. Now, there are players who are really, really good at trusting each other, despite having the appearance of that they're about to backstab each other any second now. Uh, they really look like it on the board. I've written about this on my blog, because I consider this to be one of the most fascinating things that you'll see in high-level diplomacy games. I wrote this series called like, The Layers of Diplomacy and, and how hard it is to figure out that players are lying because they know what you will do to figure out if they are lying. One of the techniques is reading the board, right? Hey, you know, this person, these two players say that they are uh, hostile, but they're moving their pieces away from each other, so obviously they're lying. Real simple, right? That the board is inconsistent with what they're saying. But some players are so good that they know that you're going to read the board to figure out what they're really thinking. So they do things like fake a fight in order to confuse everybody about who the real allies are. You really got to trust your ally to do something like that, to fake a fight with them in order just to confuse everybody else. But there are players who are like that. There are players who are capable of that level of trust, sometimes right from the beginning even. That can be very difficult. It can be very difficult to detect that they are lying about their alliance, since by all appearances, it's not a very strong one. I realize that there's something more I wanted to say about how the content of what a player is saying may be suspicious that they could be lying. This is elaborating on what I said earlier about trying to figure out what the player's moves are. If the other player is pressuring you to make very specific moves, particularly moves that they could exploit if they knew what they were, that's very suspicious. Because if a player is planning to attack you, the more precise knowledge they have about your moves the better. And if they precisely know which moves you will make, and those are moves that they can somehow exploit or counter, they can get into your centers or something. Since I know that I would do that when I'm planning to stab someone, I get suspicious when a player is like really focused on my precise moves. I'll often, to prevent backstabs, I'll say things like, listen, I'm going to move my pieces. You know, you're going to like it. You need to know uh, what I'm doing with Munich. And so I'll let you know uh, Munich is going to support hold your, your guy in Berlin. But, you know, the rest we don't really need to talk through very thoroughly. So just trust that it's going to be some good moves and I'm going to attack it or something like that. And uh, then like, well, I want to know, uh, you know, this piece should move here and this piece. Well, you know, I, why? I need to know that. That's weird. It's weird that they want to know about the movement of my pieces that they don't really strictly need to know. And that makes me suspicious. So the next broad grouping of techniques, uh, before we get to tells, is the last one I said was consider the content. And this one I'm calling consider the source. And by that, I mean some players are just liars. <laughs> they are habitual liars. And whereas others lie quite reluctantly. I think it's especially common among the beginner players who have been induced to play diplomacy. They were attracted to diplomacy in the first place because they think it's a fun game about lying. So they start lying at the first possible opportunity. But there are also some experienced players who are willing to lie over the most trivial thing. So I say, watch out for these kind of players. If you know someone to be a player who just lies a lot, or has lied over the course of the match over small things, uh, maybe not even to you necessarily, it could be to somebody else, there's a good chance that they're lying 
in basically everything they say to you. Whereas, if you consider a player to be credible as a character, that, you know, this person generally, they tell the truth or they don't lie. And they just, maybe they rarely lie in general. They haven't lied in the match. To that player, you could be more trusty when they say something that seems a little hard to believe. Do you just have a mental threshold of how reliable a player you've played with before is? Or do you keep notes of player profile of, of these types of things? I'd say that I, I have mental notes, maybe, of a sense of players I've played with before. That someone who lied to me over a small thing, like, I'll give an example, like maybe I saw them lie their way into Belgium in 1901, either during the match or in the previous match that was not that long ago, I think, oh, geez, you know, this is a person who I really shouldn't trust as far as I'll throw them because they just use lying constantly as a tactic or they think it's okay to do that and don't care so much about their overall perception. Whereas I've played matches with players who didn't, who didn't lie to me even once at all, or maybe they were hostile to me, but they were very loyal to their ally. And, uh, you know, I remember that. I remember, I go, you know, I saw so-and-so play the Austria-Russia alliance down to almost a two-way draw. I saw them do that. That takes an incredible amount of faith in your ally and keeping your word. And so then I think in the future game, okay, they're asking me to do some kind of crazy thing like Kilo a Ponto or whatever, but maybe they really mean it. I've seen them pull these things off before. I have yet another heuristic besides consider the content, consider the source, which is consider the incentive. They're still not on tells yet, and that's on purpose. So when I say consider the incentive, I think the better diplomacy players consider their credibility with the other players to be a precious resource only to be exhausted to accomplish some critical goal. Like speaking for myself, I would consider lying to a player if I'm confident that I'm going to eliminate them if my attack works or lying to save myself from imminent elimination or maybe lying to set up a solo win. But I'm really reluctant to lie over small things because I'll have burned up this precious resource that is my credibility in order to accomplish some goal that's relatively trivial and may not really matter in the long run. And so where I'm going with this is that even when you have a player who lies reluctantly, like these good players who I say behave like this, they do lie. They do lie sometimes. So how do you anticipate when a reliable player is going to lie? I say that they're likely to lie when they have a motivation to do so, when there's some big potential payoff, some major objective of theirs will be accomplished or furthered by getting away with the lot. If that is true, then they might be ready to lie. Understanding when players have this incentive to lie, this does require you to understand diplomacy holistically. And uh, of course, we can't get into all that. We can't get into all that today, but I'll, I'll try to give an example of what I mean by thinking about diplomacy holistically to evaluate the incentive. Let's say you're Russia and you're working with Germany. And Germany has asked you to risk keeping St. Petersburg open so that you can accomplish something together. It's possible that Germany will just stab you and grab St. Petersburg. But maybe not. Germany's incentive to stab you for St. Petersburg is not very much and could even be counterproductive for Germany because that will foreclose your Russian presence in the north. Like foreclosing it like that encourages you to attack Germany over land. You might even now need to do that in order to get a good result. Not only does Germany incentivize you to attack, but is possibly pretty vulnerable to do so and incentivize you to do it. In other words, I'm saying it's not a very smart play for Germany to stab Russia over St. Petersburg like this, and so it's probably not a lie. But Let's say it's the same situation, except you're Russia working with England. England has a massive incentive to seize St. Petersburg from Russia, as that can change England from a power that has three neighbors to a power that has just two. And there's basically nothing Russia can do about it afterwards. 
since Russia can't subsequently do a land invasion of England, uh, like Russia can for Germany. So if England is asking you, Russia, to just trust them not to take St. Petersburg, now that you should treat with some skepticism, because the incentive for England to break that promise is very big and therefore very tempting. Obviously, there's infinite variations on this example. I'm just trying to illustrate a, like a broad point that to understand when a player is incentivized to stab you, you do have to appreciate the mechanics of diplomacy. And that really can't be divined from how your uh, this other player behaves and acts, but rather the diplomacy board itself, how the game works, how the powers work. And so understanding the powers and the stalemate lines and all that will actually help you get a lot better at detecting lies because you'll understand when someone has been incentivized by the game to lie to you. Let's say you suspect that someone lied to you and you act in a way that you cannot exploit, that they cannot explore you. What do you do if you really told the truth and he wasn't, to, and he wasn't about to stop you? I have an ally and he told me that he will do something. And I believe this is a lie and he will try and turn on me in this turn. So I move defensively or maybe even attack him because I think that, that he is lying to me. And it turns out that he wasn't lying to me. What do I do in such a situation? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I'm going to write this down and get to that later in the conversation, if that's all right. The converse of that two is you know what if somebody else thinks you're lying but you're not how do you handle that and i think there's one more before that which is what if you think someone's lying what do you do right then right i mean you might if you have that at the end but that's not an easy question to answer but i think those three all go together as sort of a reaction element but i think you should probably continue on with the talking about lies and then we can get to all that at the end yes i think that's good so this is this is probably the topic that I'm finally getting into this topic of spotting tells, which is what uh, maybe was the most interesting to some people. Just the concept of tells is intriguing to some people. And I think most people are better at this than they realize. And I'll, I'll get into some specific stuff. The first thing to understand about spotting tells, or I consider this to be just a threshold thing to appreciate, is to recognize that most people become nervous when they are lying. Even people that are very good liars, what they're usually doing is concealing their nerves with like acting, basically. And if someone can really just tell bald-faced lies without feeling any kind of way about that, they might have sociopathy, in which case they'd be a very good spy and very good at diplomacy, perhaps, but you might not be able to detect <laughs> that they're lying to you by these methods. Most people, there's something, though. There's some sign that comes across in their nerves. Even in online press diplomacy, really, their nervousness can come across in the style of how they write and how that changes, or something like they'll repeatedly send messages to you without your responding in between. You know, okay, that's that's weird that they're they're nervous. They keep they keep coming back. Now they might they might be nervous for some other reason. I'm not saying that the only reason people become nervous is that they're lying but that if there's other signs that they are lying, plus they're very nervous, you know, maybe that's enough to reach the conclusion that this person's lying. In person, there's all kinds of little signs. Something like touching, touching your face or rubbing a part of your body, like your belly or your face, that is a sign of being nervous, especially your face because lying can make your face flushed or the nerves can make your body feel uncomfortable liars, they unconsciously react to the discomfort, the physical discomfort of the nervousness by touching themselves somewhere or clenching their fingers or, or gripping something. I'll share a story. When I was a teenager, I played a, a lot of games that involved lying and bluffing, like poker and, and mafia with my immediate family and even my extended family. We played a lot together and that's a pretty fun experience in my youth. And uh, one time we were playing, I think we were playing Mafia, and uh, my younger sister called me out as a liar because she observed that I had tucked my toes up under my feet while I was lying. 
something that I had unconsciously done <laughs> due to the tension of, of insisting that I wasn't in the mafia when I was. There's a lot of different ways people will express this nervous feeling, but where you can get better at detecting this tell is by understanding or, or reading or learning about the kinds of body language that people have when they are nervous. They won't look you in the eye, for instance. Now, there are some people who just habitually don't look you in the eye, like that's just how they grew up or that's their culture or maybe they, you know, they just got some, they're just different. They don't look you in the eye. That doesn't mean they're lying all the time. But let's say there's somebody who usually looks you in the eye. And now when they're saying something that's highly questionable, they're also not able to look you in the eye while they're saying it. Hmm. <laughs> you know, why, what this, I'm already suspicious of what you're saying. And you can't even look me in the eye while you're saying it. Maybe you're lying. Another tell of this kind is hesitancy. If you remember earlier in this masterclass, I talked about how liars can struggle to keep their story straight because the lie is complicated and it's harder to remember than the truth because they already have to remember the truth and the lie and possibly multiple lies all at the same time, like if they're telling different lies to different players. So one way that the challenge of keeping a story straight can manifest is a delay in how the person keeps the conversation moving or like an, an uncharacteristic hesitancy in responding to your conversation points. And what can be happening in this situation is that they're having to think really hard about their lies and remember what they said or saying to other players or they're having to juggle the truth and the lie in their brain at the same time. And this is slowing them down. Myself, I being aware of this, that this is a common tell, so there's a way to make yourself harder to read. You can make it a habit to become a, a methodical thinker and a slow talker. And if you just are all the time seem to be methodical and kind of slow, you won't act any different when you're lying. But some diplomacy players, they think really fast and they're fast talkers. And so they suddenly get slowed down when they're getting tripped up over their confusing lies, and that's how you can detect it. Another tell, particularly for diplomacy, but I think this is this is a universal tell, is as the situation is getting difficult in the communication, like maybe you're skeptical of what they're saying, then they react with intense and maybe negative emotion like anger or rudeness or they're patronizing you or whatever. Some other putting emotional pressure that only that is uncharacteristic and, and only came about when you're trying to parse what they're saying. And I think this is because the lying player will have developed a really complicated scheme for how these lies are going to work and how it's going to pay off for them. And if they think that you're not going to act as they're hoping, they can become really upset that their scheme is going to come crashing down around them or be for nothing despite all their effort. This feeling can manifest as they're acting really mean or rude when, from your point of view, uh, you're just like, you know, not giving them what they want on this one thing. Like, this really shouldn't be a big deal. But they are running out of time or running out of options. They said so many lies, they're going to inevitably get caught. They'll resort to using the emotional pressure to get what they want, even though they weren't doing that before. I will emphasize that some players act abrasively all the time. That's just how they act. And so you can't read too much into that. But I am saying that when a player who was up until now pretty chummy uh, and is now acting this way without your giving them a reason to do so other than you're just sticking, you know, just hung up on one specific point, they might be lying to you. That's what I'm talking about. High pressure emotional tactics do work in diplomacy, but they don't work over and over. They usually work once in a while. So if the player is planning to attack you anyways, maybe they don't care that much about maintaining good rapport with you in the short run. So even though there's this diplomatic cost to them irritating you, it's not that much because there's not much opportunity cost here because they're planning to attack you anyway with this surprise attack and they're going to set your diplomatic relationship on fire. By doing so, uh, so what's it to them? Another tell that I look for is a 
loss of interest in your conversation or like in your personality because the player only has so much time in a turn if they're planning to attack you they may be focusing their attention on other alliance prospects and there's really not a lot of value to them in developing the personal relationship with you because they're just going to attack you anyways or they're even hoping you'll be destroyed maybe and then all that will be for nothing even if they change their mind later and they want to work with you after attacking, they probably think that it would be easier to make amends if they had first kind of neglected the relationship with you prior to attacking and only really put their effort in when they were more sincere about it. And I know we talked about how there, there are legitimate reasons why a player wouldn't pay attention to you, and so let's, I'll repeat that here. However, if you see that they have kind of lost interest in talking to you in combination with some of these other signs that could be evidence that they're lying. And I will say this also, some players do make excuses about why they aren't paying attention to you that are also lies. Gotta be wary of that sometimes. Like uh, when I, I played online press games, for instance, where someone says, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't talked to you all weekend. Uh, I was really busy with something. And I go, okay, that's that's plausible, that's plausible. But then I messaged France. I say, hey, France, so-and-so, uh, have they been talking to you this weekend? You know, I just wanted to see how, how it's going with that. And they're like, oh, yeah, so-and-so has been messaging me all weekend. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So it turns out that they weren't just generally checked out. They were ignoring me specifically. Uh, and they certainly did lie about that. Their excuse was I wasn't, you know, I was busy this weekend. Well, you were busy, but not too busy to play diplomacy, just too busy to talk to me. I'll also, I'll offer this catch-all conclusion about tells which is that you can look for their acting weird in any other way like any sudden or noticeable change in a player's demeanor or body language can be a sign that they are lying this is because lying successfully requires a certain degree of composure and most people appreciate that this makes them gain a certain kind of self-awareness or like self-consciousness we might call it awkwardness as they initiate the lying and are trying to keep the lie from being detected that awkwardness can manifest in some way that is just totally specific to that individual person i couldn't describe it broadly but it's like something like how they're posturing how they lean in or out or how they look or don't look at other people with their gaze or the inflection tone or their voice like like literally anything about how they carry their body that's different suddenly could be suspicious and so i can't possibly describe all these individual the point that i'm trying to make here this could be something that even applies to this one specific human being and would not be a tell for somebody else i'm saying that people who the People who are good at spotting lies, like really good players, not just at diplomacy, but in other games like this, where there's, there's an element of lying, that they learn to just be observant and perceptive and look for ways that people change somehow when they are lying, and that may be repeated in the future. This may, this may be, require some trial and error where you think, hmm, you know, this person took off his glasses after he said this weird thing. Did that turn out to be a lie? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. He had to take off his glasses while he was lying for some reason. I don't know why. Is that really true? And see if it happens again. You know, well, he's taken off his glasses, and I'm really suspicious that what's coming out of his mouth is lies. And that happened last time. It didn't. Maybe, maybe you just developed a superstition. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe you, maybe you caught on to a tell. Before we get to the questions, I actually have some advice that may be germane to those questions, which is that it's not enough just to detect or to sense that players are lying to you. You got to be willing to act on that or it doesn't really matter. And uh, when I write about diplomacy or I'm teaching people, uh, I really love this reference to Spider Man. I'm a big Spider Man fan. And everybody who knows Spider Man. They know that Spider-Man's got a spider sense. The spider sense is this, like, I don't know, it's a superpower that just tells him when danger is approaching. He just feels that danger is near. Even if he doesn't consciously appreciate what that danger is, 
And I say human beings do have some natural ability to detect lies and diplomacy players in particular develop this sense with respect to diplomacy through their experiences. So like all these things that we talked about earlier in this discussion, all these techniques that you could use to detect lies, your brain is capable of sensing those things unconsciously, even as your conscious thought is not considering those points in a precise way. And you can absolutely get into a situation where you think, mm, this player is lying to me. I couldn't tell you why, but I just, I just know that they are. And the reason that you can sense it is something in what they said or the way they said it that's just so similar to how you've been lied to before, or that the liar may not realize what they're doing to give it away. And maybe neither do you. Maybe you don't really consciously appreciate it, but you can still tell because your spider sense told you that this was a lie. I've taught a lot of people to play diplomacy over the years. For some players, I think, their weakness is not so much that they fail to sense when they're being lied to, but that they are unwilling to react to the signs when they are there. That's tough. Your rivals are going to pressure you not to react. They're going to call you paranoid, you know, crazy, etc. And so I say, here's my advice. When you're feeling guilty or worried that you're being foolish, recite this mantra. It pays to be paranoid. Say that to yourself. I mean, out loud, in the words, reassure yourself. Mm, in diplomacy, it pays to be paranoid. 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 Say that to yourself until you've reassured yourself that it is okay to react to your suspicions. That's part of the game. A similar psychological trap, I guess, is that you can get into a situation where you might think like, well, I have no choice but to trust this player, or I have no choice but to trust someone. And uh, once in a while, that is really the case, that there's, there's really not a lot you can do but just trust someone and hope for the best. But you might be using that logic to justify yourself treating lies as true because it seems like too much effort to behave otherwise, or like it's too terrible to contemplate that you could be being lied to that extensively. And so you end up acting exactly the same as if you had been deceived, even though you detected the lies. So what's the point? I'll, I'll try to make a concrete example of what I'm talking about. Let's say you are France at the start of the match, and the way England, Germany, and even Italy are acting is setting off your alarm bells. It is entirely possible that all three of them are conspiring to attack you, and you are not obligated to just trust one or all of them and hope for the best. You could play an opening that guarantees all their attacks will fail and that you capture at least one supply center, which would be Paris to Burgundy supported by Marseille, rest to English Channel. If you're right, that strong defense could cause them to change sides later on or give up on their attack. And in any case, even if they persist in their attacks, every turn that you buy by defending yourself well is another opportunity to turn around the terrible diplomatic situation. There are some players, I, I know them, and they think that they just have to get an ally from turn one. They have to, and invariably bet on at least one neighbor telling the truth. And from time to time, this leads to them just getting destroyed. You may even be getting targeted precisely because they are trusty in 1901. Look, if you feel good about your neighbor or player and you think they're being honest, then by all means, like, bet on them keeping their word. There, there's some really great explosive alliance openings out there, and, and you should try them from time to time. But what I'm saying is you don't have to bet on any particular player keeping their word. You could just fend for yourself from 1901 and, and further into the game, buying as much time as possible through some defensive tactics so that you can turn the situation around. Ben mentioned earlier that you were saying it pays to be paranoid, but sometimes when your your accusation, does that ever lead to a dissolution of an alliance when you're accusing a person or just suggesting that they might stab you? So I say that um, a good ally, a good alliance, is one in which you are able to have a healthy conversation about the possibility of backstabbing each other and what you might need to do to mitigate those incentives and opportunities. 
And if you are playing with an ally who is taking the attitude that how dare you, how dare you think that I could ever attack my ally even though I have this position that makes it really great for me to do so or something, that player is probably trying to set up for a backstab and they're just using their press to keep that option open and maybe it's not really the best ally for you. The alternative, I guess, is that they're a really inexperienced player and they're not really willing to entertain what you're saying because they don't understand the tactical position, in which case you don't have to come on so strong. You can just politely say like, hey, you know, I realize you maybe don't realize that you're in a position that's like pretty good for backstabbing me or you will be, and I want to mitigate that. And so like, if it's all the same to you, could you like put Munich in Berlin instead? And they're like, uh, no, I really, it absolutely has to be in Munich. But, but why though? It being in Munich just sets you up to stab me. You realize that, right? Like, can't, can't you, you know, give me something here? Well, I'll tell you what, is there something I can give you? You know, if you move Munich back to Berlin, that's something I'm looking for. What could I give you in return, you know, that would, that would help you out or whatever. Have some friendly conversation. I guess my advice is in being tactful in this conversation. You don't have to say, I think you're about to backstab me or I think you're lying to me. You say, like, hmm, I'm feeling concerned right now. I'm feeling anxious. And uh, what I need is some reassurance in your moves that your intention is to continue to work with this alliance. And so I have some ideas here about how I could get that reassurance. Uh, here's this move would work. This move would work as well. I'm willing to hear your ideas also. But just, just something here, you know, the position is just not to my liking entirely. And uh, I'm looking for some way to improve that. What can you do for me? And, and what can I do for you? And if you present your position that way, I think very few people would have a hard time getting angry about it if you were that tactful and they got upset. I, I, would, just, I would just take that as a sign that they really, they're really are lying or something, like my earlier reasons that they're upset because they're trying to get away with something. Does that make sense? To a certain extent, it absolutely does. I think all that's very true. I think my primary concern, though, was that some people like to stick with alliances when they believe their partner is committed to the alliance. And if I am saying, oh, I'm suspicious of you, they might say, oh, they're suspicious of me anyway, and not get upset, but just make moves against me because they think the alliance is in dissolution anyway. But it's very hard to predict these specifically. And uh, also, I think especially the tactics that you're describing are perfect for once you have a well-developed alliance. But if you're in 1902, 1903, and you're trying to get that, you know, control with your alliance over your side of the board, it's just a very fluid part of the game, isn't it? Oh, sure. It's about the trust you have. It's about whether you're wearing down trust with your ally by raising the point. Oh, or actually, if I can turn this into an actual question, what happens when your ally just says yes? I hate that. When I say, okay, here's the plan, here's what I need to do, and they say, great. And I'm like, I can't read that. You just gave me a one-word answer, you know? <laughs> so I think you can head that off by including some options in the plan that you propose. I deliberately do this where I propose a plan to like, like two variations where I say, okay, here's plan A. We think we want to go all out against Italy. And here's plan B. if We want to also hedge against this other scenario. And so what do you think? I'm not sure which one. Even if I really do want plan A, let's say I propose two plans at the same time just to compel my ally to engage with the conversation. Because if they don't, and I'm like, okay, I propose two really different plans and you're not really reacting to this or talking about the pros and cons, maybe you're not very serious about the alliance. And so there's an ulterior motive in that, which is to accomplish the kind of thing you're talking about to get a better read on my ally. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. I appreciate that. It's a good idea. As far as reacting to being lied to, it seems like there's really two questions in this conversation, and I think the conflation of those two questions is what makes it seem difficult to think through what you're supposed to do. One question is, how do I react when I don't know if I'm being lied to or not, but I'm just really worried? And how do I react when I'm decided that I'm being lied to? So if you have concluded that you're being lied to, then I say react accordingly. Maybe this is my advice. This is part of the brother board approach to playing diplomacy that I advise in many things, which is I say back your reads. 
try to get a sense of what the other players are doing, what are their intentions, what are their moves, and then choose your moves in the context of specific predictions of how you think the other players are playing the turn. That sometimes leads to wrong gambles. Uh, you gamble and lose. <laughs> you know, you, I, I bet everything on, I, on this read, and it was totally wrong, and uh, you get a, a really bad result. But because diplomacy, in my opinion, requires taking big gambles in order to win or to do really well, if we're saying we just got to take gambles somewhere, then try to back your leads. So I said, specifically in the context of detecting another player's lies, if I conclude I think this player is lying to me about what they said, and then I think, okay, if they're lying, what are they going to do instead? Sometimes uh, I'll go as far as to say that the lies actually give away the truth, that I can reverse engineer what they were trying to get me to do from what they, what they want me to do X, they promised to do Y, and if they were lying, though, it's because they're going to do Z. Yeah, yeah. Z is actually what they're going to do. And so, and so they, uh, they, they're, they're, there'll be this astounding moment in which I completely counter everything they were going to do, despite the fact that they lied so thoroughly, etc. No one, no one told me they were going to do those moves. No one gave it away. But I simply detected it from reverse engineering what they were trying to accomplish. I love that moment. That is an extremely satisfying moment in diplomacy. When you detect somebody's lie and reverse engineer their moves and then counter their moves, it is totally possible to do. I've done it plenty of times. So because of that, because of the huge payoff that can come from backing your needs of other players, I say do it, even if sometimes that's wrong. Oh, well, okay, learn from experience. Just do better next time. Don't develop a habit of never going with your reads because sometimes your reads are wrong. I don't think that's a way to get really good at diplomacy. You want to reach a point where your reads are like, they are mostly right. They're right 75% of the time. They're right 90% of the time. Yeah, yeah. That's how you want to play. And to get there, you're going to have to start having faith in yourself and and doing stuff like that. Like, all right, I think this guy's lying to me. I'm pretty sure. You know what? I, I'm making that decision. I'm going to proceed accordingly. There's a different situation where you're merely worried that somebody's lying to you or worried that they're going to attack by surprise, uh, but you don't feel confident. That's not really your read. You're not thinking to yourself, so-and-so's lying to me. I definitely think so. I think they're going to attack. You're just worried about it, and you don't really have... You're not comfortable making that call. And in that situation, you often have at least three ways to proceed. And which way you want to proceed is probably going to be dependent on your strategic goals for the match. And here are the three ways to proceed. One is to just assume they're out to get you and react accordingly. It may be true, maybe not true, but you're just going to, you're just going to make a wild gamble on that and uh, see what happens. The second path is to do some kind of bet hedging moves where you advance your goals or something with the player. Mostly keep your word, but like maybe keep some units in reserve in case you're wrong. And the third is to just shrug it off and say, you know, I'm really worried about it, but but I'd rather just trust them and hope for the best. And that's a perfectly perfectly reasonable choice as well under such circumstances. You can decide to gamble on trusting someone you're not really sure about. That's that's okay. That's very reasonable in diplomacy. But which path I would take would depend on the goals I'm trying to accomplish. For example, let's say I'm in a diplomacy match that has draw size scoring, aka cow hammer points. And I don't think a solo win is realistic for me anymore. So I'm just playing for a draw to get a place in this draw. And the number of centers I have doesn't really matter. The number of centers anyone has doesn't really matter. I just need to make sure I can't be excluded from the draw so that I can collect my points or whatever, move on to the next round or move up in the ladder. In that case, I'm heavily incentivized to go with the first course of action of just going with the, with the maximum paranoia, defending myself just to be sure, because I already don't think I can solo win. So advancing further across the board doesn't really matter because the number of centers I have doesn't matter. I just need to make sure I can't be eliminated. And so my, with my incentive being so high on I can't be eliminated, I must not be eliminated, I don't want to take that kind of risk. Whereas, let's say that there's carnage scoring. Let's say that in the situation I'm in, the only way I can possibly hope to win the tournament at all is to get a solo win. And if I don't get a solo win this in this match, it doesn't really matter what happens. Nothing else matters. In that case, I should just gamble on playing with my ally because even if I'm wrong and they were lying and they backstab me and I get eliminated, so what? You know, ending the match with a tiny draw score or something like that wouldn't have made any difference 
but the outcome will determine anyway, so I'm, I'm essentially risking nothing. So when I'm faced with a tough call on whether to defend myself or to take a risk, I got to factor in the, the circumstances of the match. Is there a scoring system? Is this a tournament? Where's my incentive lie? But I will say this. If I was really confident that they were lying to me, I would back my root. <laughs> I find that a very satisfying moment in a diplomacy match. As far as the diplomacy itself of reacting to being lied to, I there's a lot of different ways you could. So like one is reacting to the line as it is happening. The first thing is don't I don't get angry when you know, a player has not really been proven to lie to you. Like that's that's not cool. If I think someone's lying to me on this turn, then I I can resolve the situation without having a confrontation of whether they're lying or not. Like, let's say it's opening moves, and I'm France, and Germany's like, hey, you know, um, let's just leave Burgundy open. I think we should do that. We should leave Burgundy demilitarized zone. And for whatever reason, you know, let's just assume I conclude the German is lying. I think that they're going to move right into Burgundy if I agree to this demilitarized zone. I don't have to say, I think you're a liar, Germany. I think you're a lion, and you're going to go into Burgundy. I can just say, yeah, that's a nice idea. That's a nice idea. I don't, I don't really like Burgundy DMZ when I play as France. So uh, how about we bounce in Burgundy instead? And they go, well, no, I really think we should leave it as a DMC. Go, yeah, I heard you. Well, I'm going to move to Burgundy, and you can bounce me or not bounce me. I leave it up to you. And so I didn't have to confront them about being a liar. I just had to say, listen, man, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move my army to Burgundy, and you can bounce it or not bounce it. And uh, I'll never know if they were lying, probably. But that's a way to handle a situation where you think you're being lied to without necessarily ruffling your feathers, to just proceed as though they're lying and declare your intentions and say, well, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this though. I'm going to do this thing. You can tell them in advance what you're planning to do so that you're not a liar. And a lot of times that'll get you through the situation. As far as after you found out that someone has lied to you, like they stuck the knife in your back, I feel like that's maybe its own entire topic beyond the scope of what we could talk about today. But hopefully that first example helps. We got this other question here about what do I do if I think someone is lying and I attack them, but I was wrong. Uh, ooh, a, a wise teacher of mine told me, and this maybe gives away that I am at where I'm from a little bit in my background. He said, if you must eat crow, it's better to eat that crow while it is young and tender than uh, when it is old and tough. The reason why I'm deploying this, this metaphor, this saying, is that if you uh, attack someone out of sheer paranoia and you were wrong, probably the thing to do is to apologize and make the most of it and try to do that as fast as you can. I will offer an exception which is that if you attack them in such a way that they're likely to be eliminated now, <laughs> you might want to just kill them dead so that they can't take any revenge on you for what you did. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty ruthless. But if it looks like they can just be finished off, if there, there's a player who I've betrayed, I try to finish them off yeah, usually if I can. But if that doesn't look possible, like, oh, shoot, I backstabbed my ally over nothing, and I'm not going to be able to really do anything about it, then... I gotta apologize and make amends. And uh, sometimes that can be pretty steep, uh, what it takes. A last question here was, what if someone thinks you're lying, but you are not? And that's really interesting. I'd say that circles back to the beginning of this conversation in which I said that in order to understand lies, we have to understand truth. And so you're dealing with a fellow player who apparently doesn't uh, perceive truth when it's sitting right in front of them. Like you're, you're beating them in the face almost with this truth, this truth. Let me let me lay it on you. Here's some truth, and uh, they're not following you. you know, they're not taking it as true. This is the simplest way I can put it. The exact same techniques you would use to manipulate players into believing your lies are the same techniques you can use to manipulate them into believing your truths. 
in diplomacy, when you're communicating with other players, it probably is advantageous to you to not think of what you are saying so much of as, here's some truths I'm saying, and here's some lies I'm saying, but rather reverse engineer what you want the other players to do. And then from there, decide whether you could influence them to do the thing that you want with the truth. And if that doesn't seem possible, whether it's worth resorting to a lie to do so, since, since lies carry risks and be caught, etc. But if you're thinking in it in these terms, like what I really want is for England to move a fleet into North Sea. That's what I want to happen. Are there any truths I can convey to England that would cause England to do so? Or are there things I can say to England's neighbors that would cause England's neighbors to say something that would cause England to do so? You know, what can I do? Just to, oh, go around and around. Here's a lie I thought of that might cause England to move to North Sea. Okay, well, that might work. Is it worth it? Is it worth using up one of my precious lies? You know, I'm only going to be able to get away with so many lies in this game. Is it worth doing it? Getting England to move to North Sea? If the answer is no, then maybe I'll just let it go and see what happens. And if the answer is yes, this is actually... A, some kind of mission critical development, then maybe I'll try doing that. Once you're thinking in terms of, I am using my communications in part to influence other players to do things, and whether I am saying a truth or a lie is just incidental. It doesn't really matter per se whether it is truth or lies. Uh, what matters is what does it motivate them to do. Then you can perhaps improve your technique at getting players to believe your truths because it was the same techniques you used to get players to believe anything. The point is just to persuade them. And I'll also leave you with this, that this is how you can become a nearly undetectable liar because if your approach to telling truths and telling lies is so similar, it's so much the same thing, the way you're going about doing it, it will become extremely difficult for other players to tell the difference. If you can reach a point where you are lying very rarely, but when you do, it is nearly undetectable, you will be a very successful diplomacy player. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. I learned a lot, and I, I took some notes, uh, though it should come out in the diplomacy briefing. I really liked your emphasis on not starting with tells, but actually starting with what a person is actually telling you. And I uh, hope we can pick your brain at some future date again. You've been listening to Masterclass. To participate in future Masterclass sessions, please join the Virtual World Diplomacy Community's Discord server by following the link in the episode description. And remember to subscribe to the Diplomacy Dojo podcast for Brother Boards Dojo as well as future Masterclass recordings. Thanks to Frederick Larden for the music Robot is Chilling, used here in our intro and outro.